Item two on the agenda are presentations on proclamations. There are none. Third item is public comment. Are there members of the public that would like to ask questions or make comments regarding, regarding items that are not on the agenda this evening? Uh, seeing none, we'll move to the consent calendar. Uh, are there any items on the consent calendar that the council would like to remove for further discussion? Seeing none, I'll take a motion for the Pat, adopting the consent calendar. I'll make that motion. <clears throat> second. There's been a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Item five is the city manager's oral report. Uh, very briefly for the council, I uh, wanted to uh, first let the council know that on Saturday I joined uh, Councilmember Morrison and we met with the Homeowner Association in Rose Lane, those members that, uh, residents who elected to come uh, and covered a variety of topics. And I just wanted to let the council and the community know that any time they, particularly for homeowner associations or other groups, if they'd like uh, for me or other members of staff to meet with them, we're always available to do that. It was a uh, I think we were there for over two hours and had a really nice conversation on a variety of topics. So uh, always happy to do that. Um, secondly, uh, there's a survey we're currently doing as part of our process for planning the park signage format. Um, there was a little mix up in, in miscommunication and so we had indicated that uh, this pr the survey would be closed today after we had announced it on next door, I think yesterday. Uh, it's actually open through the weekend, so we've clarified that uh, and fixed that issue so folks can go in and, and do the survey all through the weekend. We've actually had an overwhelmingly uh, overwhelming participation rate since we put it on next door, which is a reminder that that's a very uh, lively uh, tool for outreach in our community. Uh, and encourage folks to go on. The survey is just to ask which of the dif different styles of signage that other communities have used are of interest to people and it gives some open-ended opportunity to comment on signs. And I'll remind the council members and the public, um, we're not gonna remove all the signs in all the parks tomorrow. Uh, what we want is to have an adopted signage program with a look and feel for all our signs so that as the opportunities come up to replace the signs, we start to do so with some uniformity throughout all of our uh, parks. So. Um, please, folks, uh, go to our website, cityoflarksburg.org, and you'll find there's a link right there on the home page to take the survey. And then uh, I just wanted to let the uh, council know um, and the public know that um, Larkspur and Corte Madera in total sent uh, four crews to help with the fires in the North Bay uh, over the course of the event. Um, including three that uh, went immediately as soon as we had heard uh, that night that the fires had broken out. Uh, I want to thank all of the fire department, not just those that went up to the fires themselves in, in Napa and Sonoma, but also the fire crews that stayed behind because we had to make sure we were fully protecting our community while providing this support to our neighbors. And so. Um, it was a, a collective effort of all the fire agencies in Marin to do both of those things simultaneously. Um, and they did yeoman's work and, and are to be t commended uh, for everything that, that happened. So um, I'm sure that in the days that come, as Chief Schertz has a chance to summarize our participation, we'll get that information out. So with that, I'll turn it back to the council. Uh, Okay, uh, city manager, any questions for the city manager? I have, if I have. Council member Way. Do, uh, Dan, do we have any um, current status update on the JPA for Central Marin fire from the Sacramento standpoint? Um, yes, yes, we, I can provide a small update. The, um, the issue we've run into is that uh, we're, I, I know I say this a lot, but we're trying to shove our square peg into a yeah. round hole. So with CalPERS, uh, we've run into some challenges with um, what 
well, CalPERS has become alarmed about the very nature of joint powers authorities mm. because the joint powers authority in Southern California dissolved and the member agencies under law are not responsible for the liabilities of that joint powers authority. So CalPERS suddenly finds itself with a number of folks who've earned pension credits but nobody to charge for those pension credits given that the agency dissolved. Hmm. So unfortunately we've gotten caught in the wake of CalPERS trying to figure out how they're going to deal with that sort of situation going forward and it's not that any of us think our JPA will ever have this issue but CalPERS now needs to think okay. about this. So. Um, we're working through it. We're coming up with some compromises so we can keep ourselves moving forward toward our target date. And then my second question is, do we ha did we experience any Central Marin PD or Central Marin Fire personnel losing uh, their homes, like Mill Valley's fire chief lost his? Uh, no staff. Uh, no staff. Sworn or not sworn. Okay. That I'm aware of lost a home. We did have a number of staff whose relatives and uh, were affected. Uh, but I'm not aware of any employee that lost lost their home. Good. All right. Thank you. Councilmember Chu. Oh yeah. I just uh, wanted to add. We also had uh, Central Marin Police assisting in, you know, patrolling neighborhoods and things like that. Yeah, thank you. I was remiss in mentioning that we sent two officers on a regular basis to participate in those patrols. There's, are there members of the public that would have questions or want to make comments on the city manager's oral report? Seeing none, we'll move to our business items. Item 8.1. Or I'm sorry, council members, oral reports and comments. Any council members have reports tonight? Uh, I would just uh, like to, maybe we can pick this up at the end before we adjourn, have a statement on the agenda uh, in memory of those lost in the, in the disaster in the, in the north and, and in uh, expression of our sympathy and support for our those impacted in the uh, North Bay counties Hi, and in, in uh, gratitude for the first responders, for everybody that and volunteers that have uh, come together. I think it's uh, important to, to note that. All right, uh, I'll, Council Member Way. Um, since we're on that same subject, um, it's been extraordinary disasters, and we need to pay. Uh, extreme attention to the uh, chances that this could be part of what we experience here. So I sit on the Twin Cities Disaster Preparedness Committee and um, also the DC3, which is the County Disaster Council. And I want anybody who's listening, anybody in the audience, really encourage people to go on www.readymarin.org. It's the go-to place in Marin County to get a lot of information, checklists of what to do, how to prepare your family, and it's also a place to get information about classes that are taught the CERT class, which is the community emergency responder, because the neighborhoods were crucial in these last fires to help each other. So one thing that we've done in the Twin Cities is neighborhood response groups, and that's what we're really focused on, and we're going to see a lot more of that in the next sev several months after this. But you can also find out if your neighborhood wants to get involved in organizing itself, it's nrgmarin.org. And Lastly, I it was able to bring to the Marin mayors and council members an ad hoc committee on disaster preparedness that will be on the agenda on Wednesday, next Wednesday. Um, and I've already had seven council members from other cities want to come together so that we as council members can um, work at cross-jurisdictional planning. So that was that. Council Member Morrison. I sit on the um, Marin Women's Commission uh, representing District 2, Katie Rice. And um, <clears throat> I am going to chair the, um, let's see, it's called the Marin Teen Girls Conference. It's going to be <clears throat> at the end of March on a Sunday, March the 25th, 2018. The Marin Teen Girls Conference. So Mary Jane Burke is working closely with us. We send out um, uh, letters to all the high schools in Marin County along with the middle school eighth grade and we're asking for ambassadors and these two ambassadors from each school along with two ambassadors from the eighth graders they're called the junior ambassadors they help us put up this conference together we received over a hundred applications 
and uh, our ambassadors we met for the first time last Sunday. It's fantastic. So this conference, I'm in the process of looking for a keynote speaker. It's uh, Women Empowering Girls. We have over 25 workshops that they can choose from. It's a one-day conference. It's held at the Embassy Suites, and it's <clears throat> we have 300 to 350 girls attend. So we're looking forward to March the 25th, 2018, for the Marin Teen Girls Conference. Thank you. Other council member reports? Uh, I would just close the, uh, this agenda item by inviting those neighborhood members from Heather Gardens, Meadowood, and I believe the Rose Lane neighborhood to a disaster preparedness uh, meeting at the Central Marin Police uh, Authority community room on Sunday, uh, October the 22nd. I believe it's three in the afternoon till five. Uh, notices would have been posted at everybody's uh, residence, but I'm just uh, want, want this on the on the video stream this evening. Uh, all right, uh, item uh, seven is the public hearing. Uh, item 7.1 will open the public hearing for a precise plan amendment and design review number 17-13. It's the uh, consideration for adoption of an ordinance amending the precise development plan for the Lincoln Village residential development. May we have a staff report, please? Yes, thank you, Council Member Hilmer, and good evening, Council Members. Um, the applicant, Travis Torres of Max Maximus Real Estate Partners, is requesting a design review approval and amendment to the pr precise development plan approval for the Lincoln Village residential project which is currently identified as Serenity at Larkspur Apartments in Larkspur Landing. The amendment is requested to allow removal of six multi-car carports, providing a total of 75 parking spaces, uh, and replacement with attached garages, providing 49 enclosed single-car garages with storage lofts within the uh, same general footprint as the existing carports. In addition, the applicants have proposed construction of a total of nine additional uncovered parking spaces in two separate locations within the development. The proposal would reduce parking by 17 spaces uh, within the development uh, from 516 to 499 spaces, but would remain in compliance with the minimum parking standards um, that were applicable at the time of the original approval, uh, which remain in effect at this time. The uh, ordinance was considered by the Planning Commission on September 26th. The Planning Commission considered comments from the public regarding uh, reductions in parking counts and the potential for noise issues in relation to the garage doors. Uh, while members of the Commission agreed that it would be nice to maintain excess, park excess parking, uh, they generally agreed that the City should not require uh, the applicant to provide more than what is required by code. Uh, with respect to the garage doors, um, which are a common element in residential development, they indicated that they would not necessarily create a violation of the noise ordinance, uh, particularly to properties outside of the complex. Um, the general consensus of the commissioners was that the design of the garages are appropriate within the context of the 1970s era design of the apartment buildings and carports and would be an improvement to the overall appearance. Following deliberation of the project, the um, Planning Commission voted to recommending approval of the draft ordinance authorizing the proposed precise plan amendment and the design review um, to alter the parking configura configuration and number of spaces. Um, staff is recommending that the City Council introduce and waive the first reading of the draft ordinance and move to adopt the ordinance uh, to allow revisions um, at the next meeting. Um, the applicant uh, is present and has prepared a presentation for council. And if you have any questions of staff, uh, Director Toft and I will be happy to address those. Are there questions for staff from the city council? All right. Council Member Chu. Uh, with respect to the uh, 17 net loss in parking spaces, yes. is there currently um, excess capacity where you know you roughly have on average say 17 spaces that are not being used uh, the applicant does have does speak to that um, as part of their presentation and um, they did indicate that they do in fact have that excess parking um, they've done some surveys and will present that data to you mm -hmm. during their presentation now mm -hmm. if there was inadequate parking in that general vicinity 
there, I'm not aware of any street parking up there. Where, where would people park? Um, there, you're, you're correct. There is very little street parking there. Um, I'm aware of some street parking along the, um, what is that, Drake's Way? Drake's, uh, Drake's Road um, leading up to that area. But you're correct. There is no street parking in general in that area. Okay. Thank you. Other questions of staff from the council? Councilmember Way. Why is there no street parking there? I don't, I can't, I'm trying to visualize it. Is it uh, a narrow road surface? Yes, the, the roadways were um, designed for through traffic and then the parking is provided within the complexes. Um, there, the, the property um, itself um, has multiple buildings from 100 to 2700 and all of the parking is contained within the com complex with the exception of a small amount that leads up to the Drake's uh, Way development. Um, and then across, across to the west is the Marriott Hotel, um, which contains all of their parking on site, um, as well as the Larkspur Courts, which are upslope, containing all of their parking okay. on their site. Other questions? Uh, does the applicant have a presentation that they'd like to make? And then we'll open it up to public comment. Second for it to warm up. If you could uh, identify yourself for the public yeah, record, yeah, please. absolutely. Uh, my name is Travis Torres. Uh, I'm with Maximus Real Estate Partners. Um, I want to say thank you for everybody, especially Anna, for putting together the report. Uh, it's, it's very diligent and uh, very good. Uh, I, I'm here to expand a little bit more on the actual staff report itself. Um, what I want to give just a real basic overview and the real reason why we're actually doing this is we want to remain and continue being a long-term community partner, um, which also makes us enhancing the actual property itself. Um, we've heard residents to that they need more secured parking and storage themselves. And we also want to uh, be apparent with all the other communities and surrounding with secured parking, which also is Tam Ridge and Deer, Deer Valley. Um, some other items I'm going to touch on too as well is the design um, of how m uh, modest and very complimentary it's with the existing buildings, um, as well as our construction related impacts for uh, phase one. All of these construction, how we plan on constructing everything is going to be through three phases. Um, and the first construction is going to begin in 2008. Um, we're also, I'm also going to expand just a little bit too as well on uh, some annual inspections on how we make sure that these don't actually become storage containers. Um, and as well as touch a little bit on the agreement itself of how we are complying with the 499 parking spots and just a little bit of data of the transportation survey. Uh, real brief uh, project description, this was originally built in the 1970s. We do have 16 residential buildings on the property uh, with a fair amount of amenities and this, those buildings consist of 342 apartments. Um, along with what's been built with the 1970s, we've made some really significant improvements to the property. Um, this includes the apartment buildings, both clubhouses um, at both pools, as well as some, some signage and uh, landscaping improvements. Uh, we also have conducted interior renovations to, uh, to the units, and as well as more public improvements for all to enjoy, which we recently completed the city playground in 2015, and we do have planned improvements for the actual city park that's there uh, to incorporate outdoor fitness equipment, dog run, barbecues, as well as picnic tables. Um, to touch base to kind of get us oriented where, where the property is at, uh, this, is the, this is the terminal right here where the ferry terminal is, 101, and then we are tucked away right here, um, right in the northeast corner, right next to Larkspur Courts, as well as the apartments. And, and a touch on uh, where you were discussing council, uh, Councilwoman Way is, it, this is the 
back side of the property of where you're entering in, and this is where you're coming into the front. Um, a simplified map that I wanted to show you real quick was where these actual locations are, where the garages are going to be. Um, again, this is when you're walking or you're riding into the actual front of the property, into the back of the property. Um, how we plan on constructing for the phases is we're going to start back here and then move over into this, into the front of the property. Um, again, the existing conditions, I want to show you quick pictures of what they are. Uh, they're very basic construction, steel columns, metal roof decking, um, and some wood screening here that's involved. Uh, what we do plan on proposing is we want to replace the entire carport. Um, we, again, we want to highlight some of the existing features of the buildings. Um, very basic construction, again, for the wall assembly, um, a flat TPO roof with some shingles, and we also want to improve the stormwater management system with bioretention swells, as well as create and increase infiltration there. Um, just to give you an idea of what we're really going for is, I wanted to show you a picture of an existing building um, and kind of what we're, we're gearing towards for the design itself. Um, Again, for why we actually want to create this, and we've heard our, our residents as well as listened to them that they want secured parking and overhead storage. Um, this really com complementarizes family storage as well as outdoor equipment. Um, we started with 60 garages and we came down to 49 garages. Uh, the reason for that was for size requirements uh, for the city of Larkspur as well as we wanted to make sure that the locations of the actual garages themselves work with more of the bigger units, the two bedrooms and family sized areas. Uh, so the garages right now of what we're proposing are 20 feet by 12 feet and the open stalls are 18 feet by nine feet. Um, to make sure that we don't make these, make these garages such a storage compartment or an area, we're gonna be performing annual inspections with our unit inspections. Um, we do have the right to come in any time if we see that there is something wrong or if there is more storage or has hazardous materials being in there. But on a general basis uh, for the year, we're going to, while we're performing on annual inspections, we're also going to be looking at the garages too as well once they are constructed. Um, I wanted to touch base too as well of what we're improving for the stormwater management. Um, we did look at the design and the natural calx of the existing to make sure that we are. Uh, in the requirements of the permeability within the property. Um, we also wanted to help redirect the stormwater and of course, like I said before, create and um, increase infiltration with the bioretention facilities. Um, a highlight of the design too as well that I pointed out for the wood screening, um, we're gonna create a little vine box for these, uh, for these garages, which is essentially going to be a, a bioretention area for the plants to not only grow, but also create a nice little scenery for for the resident when they're coming in and pulling into the garage. Uh, precise development plan amendment. Uh, parking requirements, is, as Anna was saying before, um, we do have one bedrooms and two bedrooms on, on the property. Uh, we have 172 one bedrooms and 170 two bedrooms. Um, this basically calcs out to 499 required parking spots by the Larkspur Municipal Code that we need to make sure that we, we fall under. How our actual parking count consists is we, had, we have four, uh, 516 parking spots, um, which equals out to, oops, excuse me. Uh, again, we're adding 49 garages and we want, to, uh, we want to construct and make sure that we have the enough required parking spots, which is 490 parking stalls, which is the net loss of 17. Um, throughout, when we started this project and kind of looking at everything, we wanted to develop a transportation survey and really understand the needs of uh, our residents as well as the community. Um, the purpose for Macy, what, we, what I was saying before is one, we wanted to observe the parking demands as well as help evolve the community with any cultural shifts such as in the improved public transportation as well as any technologi te technological advances. Um, this survey did start in uh, 2005 and has been circulated usually between November through December. Um, and the survey and some of the questions that I am gonna show you that kind of help everything is uh, it was sent to all the residents of the community and received responses equating to about a 90% confidence level. Um, one of the good questions and what we always start with with these transportation surveys is where are you going? Where in the Bay are you going? Uh, we noticed that in, for our residents themselves, they're going to San Francisco, 63%, as well as North Bay, 33%, and the rest, uh, East Bay to South Bay. Once we figured out where they're going, how do you get there? 
we notice just within, again, within our community, uh, there's quite a bit of people driving, which is 30 percent, 36 percent. The ferry is about 25 percent. The rest of the transit is 11. Work from home is 10 percent. And then the rest is just walking and carpool, too, as well. Uh, when we looked at this data, we wanted to look at also, as well as, what's it like Marin versus the Bay Area itself. Um, we noticed here that even against the Marin County and Bay Area, we're still about above 25 percent um, and a little bit lower from the Marin County and Bay Area. Uh, I wanted to show this to you just because it, it's, it's a good little indicator of kind of where we're progressing in the Bay Area as well as what's going on with our community. Um, and essentially, uh, the last question that we always want to ask is how many vehicles do you actually have on site? Um, we noticed that the residents have one car for 61 percent, two cars 37 percent, as well as three plus cars is two percent. Those numbers equal out, and this is at a 100 percent capacity um, uh, occup occupancy, is 482 vehicles that would be on site, which is still less than the acquired amount, which is 499. And real quick, just I have, a, I have a question for you. Yes, go does, ahead. It, does that mean you have eight visitor spaces? Does that mean I have eight visitor if, spaces? If if you have 482 spaces, you're going to provide 499. Yes. Does that mean that there that the difference between the two numbers are your visitor spaces? No. This is this I'm, is also uh, equating into the guest parking too as well. Just for the sake of of my. Uh, curiosity, how many guest spaces are you providing? Uh, we have about 150 guest parking spots. Thank you. Yeah. And just to quick summarize everything, again, we want to be continuing as a long-term community partner um, with enhancing uh, property as well as providing um, uh, improvements to everything. Uh, the design concept, it's, it's very modest, consistent, and it, it adheres to what's going on to the features of on site. Um, we're going to be performing annual inspections for all of these garages, um, and we are complying with the 499 code requirement. Uh, and you can see that even running out of full capacity or 100% occupancy, we're still equating to about 482 vehicles on site. Questions? Thank you very much. That was yep. very comprehensive. Other questions of the applicant, Councilmember Chu? Um, you said you had 182. Yes, parking spaces. 100, uh, 150. 150, yeah. sorry. No worries. Um, these are dedicated parking units for each rental unit? Correct. So when, when, we, uh, when we lease up a resident, they are, they are given one assigned parking spot. Okay. And two bedroom also, are those like two spaces? That's one. They still get one space. I'll st still only get one. Mm -hmm. So really in... As a follow-on to Councilmember Hilmer, Vice Mayor Hilmer's uh, question, then a lot of your tenants will be using guest spaces. Uh, they will be they'll be using un uncovered spots on inside. Uh, uh, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So those uncovered spots are your guest spaces. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Councilmember Way. So expanding on that question, you also have um, uncovered spots that are for residents, too, that are still remaining carports. Is that right? In uh, the front building, the 500 building? Yeah, so all the carports themselves, anything that's covered, that those are going to be assigned parking spots. Um, and anything that is uncovered or open stalls to the environment that is uh, guests, par guest parking or anybody else that is able to use it. Are any of those tandem, or are they all side-by-side, -side, one per unit? The, the carport. Uh, the carports. There is where the 21, 2500. It, it is a, a little. It, it is tandem a little bit, uh, but they're all side by side. So, do you require residents to register a vehicle so that you know their license plate and exactly which yes. vehicle is theirs? Yes. So, just kind of coming to grips with where the numbers are lying. I'd like you to expand a little further on the concept of it not turning into a storage unit because um, I got a two-car parking garage, on-site parking, and half of it's a storage unit. So, yeah. I mean, because that's what we do these days. So uh, you're going to do yearly um, checking. Is that going to be uh, on the time of the renewal of the lease? Uh, we, we usually, it depends, uh, but... Yeah, it, it will be basically around or middle, I would say, 
uh, of the year when we do handle these annual inspections. Um, again, when we when we look in, into the unit renovations themselves, we want to look at the, the garages to make sure that there won't be any type of overload. Or so that they're actually using them for their car. Yes. And what would be your compliance um, uh, requirement? So we would have a provision actually in the lease agreement and the requirement once we see it is you need to be able to fit a whole vehicle in there as well as create a, a safe passage going in and out of your vehicle. And their penalty for not doing that? Uh, not a penalty, but there is enforcement of uh, having the resident be compliant with with uh, the inspection, and then further moving down the line, um, we can take some action going forward. Okay. Sorry. Hmm. Okay, that's it for now. Councilmember Morrison. Thank you for the presentation. How many handicapped spots do you have? Spaces? I didn't see any when I went up there today. Uh, there was five. Is that included in yes. the amount? Yes. And then when I went up Drake's way, there's plenty of people parking on the on the street. You know the street that you just showed, Councilman Way? Yeah. That was full on cars were parked. I mean, it didn't didn't seem like it was a problem. I just wanted to tell you that cars were parked there. Are they residents? I I I don't know. I'm, I'm unsure. Okay. Um, so when I went up there, the car. Um, no, actually, they're underneath the apartments. A lot of cars' tail ends were sticking out with under the up, under the apartments. So these garages, are you going to extend them out a little bit longer to accommodate the cars, or are you going to be the same size car park? I know it says it's going to all stay the same. Yeah. But it was interesting that a lot of cars seemed larger than the mm. car. Yeah, and that that came a part of uh, the design concept is that we wanted to make the actual garages big enough to to be able to fit the the uh, cars into them, mm -hmm. um, which eventually created just a little bit bigger uh, footprint, but w in which helped us reduce down to the actual car parts carport. So these are actually going to be extended yeah, uh, just a little bit. Yeah. A little bit of what? <laughs> uh, right now the the. It's, it's about 18 feet, I believe, is the requirement. We have it at 20 foot, two, two inches. Oh, and the tire sprinklers. So where are those going to be located? Uh, in every single one of those. Every garages. single one of them? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, just to, to loop back to the parking counts, so I understand how it's, how the, how the uh, 499 spaces are. Uh, Being required or? No, just how they how how they they show up on the property. How many are enclosed garages? And I and I assume that's at a ratio of one enclosed space per unit. Uh, right now, we don't have any enclosed. The garages. Right. How okay. many How many garages? Oh, there's okay. 49. 49 spaces. Yes, there, there's. We're, we're proposing 49 garages. 49 garages with one space per garage. Per unit. Per unit. How yeah. many spaces are in garages? Just one. Total. Total. <laughs> I There's a picture I too, though. How many parking spaces are in all of the total number of garages? If you were to just count the spaces that are in it. Sorry, Seth Mallon with Maximus Real Estate Hi. Partners. I work with Travis. Uh, I just want to explain something real quick because they're a little confused on the numbers here, and I think it'll be helpful to explain a little bit. So total parking today is the 516. Today what you have is 205 five, carport. Six, five, sorry, 516. I'll slow down. 16, 516. 516. You have 205 in carports. There's 153 that are tuck under parkings, which is what you saw today where the cars stick out on the back end. There's that 153 that, and those stay consistent going forward. And then the rest are about 153 open stalls and five handicapped spaces in total. That makes up the 516 that exists today. Going forward, the proposal is 130 in carports. You get 153 that remain in that tuck under condition, which is under the building itself. And they're, they don't stick out because of any reason outside of just that's the way the buildings were built back then. So the design going forward was to make them longer so the full vehicle can actually fit in that parking garage itself. And then my cheat sheet, okay, it's back in one here. And then 162 open stalls going forward. 
Now, your question on, on guest parking is a bit confusing in terms of how it's responded. I, I kind of understand the confusion. I d I'm trying to determine how many people that have more than one car are, in effect, using the guest spaces. And that's exactly what I was getting to. So essentially, when we, when Travis showed you the calculation, assuming the property is 100% occupied, meaning every apartment is full, which hasn't happened in a long time, not that I don't want it to happen, but it will at some point, maybe. And then we are using 582 spaces in total, residence all. If everyone's home and everyone's parking, 582, based on the survey data we have of the number of people that have one car, two cars, and three cars, that's a 582. So if everyone's home at the same time, in theory, the 482, excuse me, spaces would be used of the 499. It would leave us 17 open spaces for true guests at that point. Now, we all know statistically not everyone's ever home at the whole time, but it would be that case if it happened. Does that make sense? And existing, how many, uh, you have 516, uh, so you have uh, 17 plus 16 for guest spaces now. Correct. Now, in theory, if everyone were home, we would have about 33 spaces. If I'm doing the math right in my head. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. All right. Uh, as far as the guest parking is concerned, it's not happening. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm clear on that. <laughs> um, are there other questions from Council, Ca Council Member Wes? Council Member Morrison asked about um, wheelchair accessible or handicapped spots. Do you also have um, handicapped accessible apartments for rent there? Uh, no. No? No, okay. we do not. No. Just wondering to make sure if we had those that we were considering a sp this exact spot for them. Okay. Other council member questions? Are there members of the public that would like to ask questions or make comments regarding this agenda item? Yes, sir. Please step forward, identify yourself for the record. I'm uh, James Holmes Larkspur. Enclosed garages are fine, but I question whether the city should allow uh, this landlord to provide less. Uh, parking uh, for its tenants uh, at a time when parking is already in short supply at Larkspur Landing. Uh, the minutes of the Planning Commission meeting outline my concerns very well. The Commission's decision focused narrowly on the fact that after the reduction, the minimum citywide parking standards are still met. But this narrow focus uh, on the minimum citywide requirement did not consider either the specific circumstances at Larkspur Landing or how the planned unit, a planned unit development works. A planned unit development uh, in concept gives more flexibility so that a development can provide less than the minimum in some respects and more than the minimum in other things based on the specific circumstances of the site and the uh, de particular details of the project. At Larkspur Landing, the city very wisely required more on-site parking than the citywide standard because of particular circumstances at the landing, three in particular. Minimal off-street parking, higher densities, and uh, extensive adjacent commercial uses which require parking. Uh, these circumstances, which differ somewhat from citywide circumstances, all continue to exist at Larkspur Landing. Parking is tighter than ever uh, at the landing, and so the original uh, planned unit development parking requirements uh, still are still relevant and should still apply. Uh, at, incidentally, at the Planning Commission uh, meeting, uh, it, it, was, it, it came out that at the same time the landlord is reducing on-site uh, parking for tenants, uh, it's likely that uh, tenant, deme tenant demand for off-site parking may increase because at least we were told at the Planning Commission that the uh, landlord no longer will provide a uh, single parking space with a unit. Uh, the parking space will be the parking spaces will be an extra option uh, for more pay. So as a result, uh, there may well be some tenants who elect to park uh, off-site. 
so in any event, I think the city should maintain the sensible um, original uh, requirement, which takes account of the circumstances, uh, and uh, it should uh, the landlord should find a way to uh, provide uh, or to enclose its garages um, without uh, reducing parking. Thank you. Are there other members of the public that would like to ask questions or make comments on this item? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the council for discussion. Uh, who would like to start? Council Member Way. C can we ask if that, uh, I didn't see that in the Planning Commission's draft report, whether there's an extra charge for parking and whether people will be required to do that, hence the possibility of them parking off-site. So can we have the Serenity people answer that? Because I didn't see it in here. Seth Mallon again. Um, the quick answer is no. So everyone gets a parking spot Every with their unit. unit. Correct. Okay. The trick of what we're doing is the garages, because we only have 49 of them. If they want the garage, which has additional storage and space and protection, they will pay additionally more for that particular, if they want that parking spot as their unit itself, as their spot. And your surveys of your residents, did you see that they're interested in that uh, cost arrangement? Very much so. They're willing to pay more to have that benefit itself. To have the additional uh, security and storage. The security and storage, correct. Other council member discussion? Or council member Chu? Uh, not really a discussion, but maybe kind of a point to make. You know, we've heard from Transportation Authority of Marin before that, you know, there are at least as many cars in Marin as there are licensed drivers. Yeah, well, actually, there's there's more. That's why I said at least. But, um, you know, I think in large part, you know, whatever they choose to do, they're, they're meeting the parking requirement. Everything else becomes market driven because you come in to an apartment complex where you're given one parking space. You got two people who live there in two cars. You know that there's no off street parking anywhere within, you know, uh, I don't know, other than Drake's Way, probably about a quarter mile or more. So, you know, you're going to have to make a choice and say, you know, this doesn't work for us. You know, I'm, I'm just viewing it in a sense of, well, you know, what, what's, what's no, I, I, was, I already said I was just going to frame my comment here. So it, that, that's really leading up to, you know, I'm fine with the proposal, you know, the way it's uh, being presented to council. Council Member Morrison has I a do, question. I do. Is it possible? I, for any, I need somebody back up here, please. To make it 47 garages, the, why 49? Uh, Seth Malligan, it was reverse engineered in a lot of ways. So we actually figured out the footprint of the garages themselves. We worked backwards to maximize the number of garages. And just as Travis mentioned, the 60 that was originally considered was really contemplated from the standpoint of our townhome units, we have 60 of them. There are larger, more family-sized units. We ideally wanted to get 60 to match that number. When we looked at the amount of space required for the parking garages to maintain the 499 parking at a minimum on site, we could only fit 49 in there. We would actually prefer to have a little bit bigger, to be honest with you. A little bit more, excuse me. Okay, thank you. I, I have a couple of more questions for you. What, what are the what are the travel uh, lane dimensions in terms of the, the face of the of the new garage to the, the structure on the other side of the travel lane? It depends on whether it's two-way traffic or not. Two-way traffic is 26 foot wide, so it meets the uh, fire code requirements. We went through that with the fire department on the one way, I believe, off the top of my head, it's 17 and a half that had to be clear. So you, so you, you never have an issue of people uh, parking in those uh, travel lanes? Right now we do not, no. And it's enforced by not only staff on site and maintenance staff, but at night we have a courtesy patrol service that runs through four to five times a night to confirm that as well. Uh, question for staff. Uh, given the description of uh, designated spaces, and I don't know quite how to uh, capture this, but those that have more than one car per unit, uh, it was explained that they, in effect, are using guest spaces. And that so that so that the the actual guest space uh, number of guest spaces that exist now are roughly being are cut being cut in half almost. C 
considering those units that have more than one vehicle per, per dwelling unit. Uh, has staff done uh, analysis such that they're uh, satisfied with how this is organized? So that we don't have a, uh, to be worried about guests coming and needing to park off site because there's no available parking on site? Well, I think that we, we recognize that the reduction will have an impact and kind of anecdotally, it's clear there's certainly a lot of parking available during the day and at night it gets, it begins on to site. get pretty tight on site. Yeah. Um, it so does begin so to get satisfied. They won't be over spilling out onto the other properties around it. Well, I think as, as the, the two conditions are actually somewhat self, um, monitoring in that it is uh, an area that doesn't have a lot of street parking, both um, Larkspur Landing Circle and Lincoln Village Circle are, were not designed with street parking. So there's very limited street parking available nearby. I understand, but I'm more yeah. concerned about the adjacent property owners complaining that apartment dwellers are using, having to enforce parking. Uh, yeah, we're confident the hotel and uh, Larkspur Courts are both pretty well managed properties. Um, the you know, we haven't done, we haven't done a further survey on this, um, but the um, conditions are such that, you know, I, I, I think. How do, how do we ensure uh, <coughs> that there aren't unforeseen consequences of us cutting what are now get the guest spaces in half in terms of the number being used now? How do we, how do we feel comfortable that we're making the right call here that you're not your tenants who have extra vehicles are not going to be having to park off site. It's a good question, and, and I can't give you a guaranteed answer, but what I can tell you just based on what the statistics show, 42 at 100% occupancy would be that number itself. If you take 5% occupancy out, because we run an average occupancy of about 95% for the year, just between move-ins and move-outs and transitions and such, that's 5% of those units, which is roughly 16 homes. 16 homes, an average of two, gives you kind of enough for another 30 spaces or so that's available for guest parking. Part of what we were trying to show with the patterns of traffic and movement is just to understand the availability during the day of parking spaces as well and kind of how that works and where that goes. Uh, I will say just from an anecdotal standpoint and, and watching my uh, nephew who now is in college and my niece who's in high school, they refuse to get driver's licenses these days. And their whole thing is I'd rather Uber or have a friend drive me or have my parents drive me around. So it seems, and we've seen this trend in the properties we've managed in the Bay Area, and we're a Bay Area based firm, is that the number of parking, the parking demand has gone down significantly at our urban properties and it's starting to transition that way at suburban park properties. We actually support a lot of programs, uh, apart from the large community we have, we have a car free living program there, which is actually a transit and Uber subsidy program that we've done there that we're looking at implementing at other properties as well. And it's a way to encourage kind of the multimodal splits. I think Serenity is a, actually a great example of a multimodal split that works extremely well. When you look at 36% of people drive alone to work, that's actually a really low percentage, generally speaking, especially in a suburban location. Uh, when you look at how many people actually use transit at 25% on the ferry and 11% in transit generally, that's a really high penetration rate for an area like this as well. So ultimately, it's a long way of saying, I think the trends are going different from that. Well, I mean, Knock Marin's a little bit different. The mobility issues here are not quite as tidy as we would. Uh, totally understand that. I'm a resident of Greenbrae, so I, I understand that. We've been down here for three years. Uh, we see that difference, but I think it, what I'm saying is that isolated area of serenity and what that property offers and why people move there is because that can mean access to the ferry and the fact they don't feel like they need a car as often as much. Well, uh, there certainly are choices uh, nearby. I did, what I wanted to hear was the Planning Commission took all this into account. <laughs> well, I, I think they were, they felt comfortable that it wasn't going to, to create a spill and they, um, a spillover effect and that the, the area, it does have parking challenges every, every, both the commercial zones and the other um, locations. It's, it's going to um, have There's, well, I, I guess I would say I think to, and to some degree it's going to be marked as, as Larry was indicating, Council Member Chu, that it's going to be somewhat market driven and they're, they're providing um, uh, 
an area that does, you know, it's going to have limited parking for tenants. You get your one space, and the amount of um, parking provided is, um, you know, s somewhat isolated uh, to that area. And um, the other thing that we would encourage is between both the ferry and the fact that the train is going to be uh, coming to Larkspur into the near future, these may also reduce the parking demand for that location. Uh, further discussion by the council? Council Member West. Yeah, um, back to sort of piggybacking on the question about the guest spaces. And you said you have your own sort of nighttime security patrols, et cetera. Um, do you have ways of monitoring how, if a resident parks in the, for a long-term basis in a, a guest parking? that that would also be disincentivized? If they take car number two and they just park in the extra spot there and they leave it for a week or two, is there a, a, uh, an hour time limit that guest parking is? There's not an hour time limit or a time limit on it specifically. If someone abandons the car or if it looks like it's been sitting for a period of time, we do tag it and mark it okay. and we notify that. Uh, we also ask that residents, and this is something new, is we're looking at, at badge parking so that we actually know who are residents and who are not. That's not something we've done before at this property, but it's something becoming more evident. Yeah. Uh, and just to go on the kind of line of Larchford Courts and then the Marriott next door, we have good working relationships with them and we work with them. And if they have issues with our residents parking there, they've always called us instead of a problem. And I know at one point, two or three years ago, we ran into that with the courtyard by Marriott and we had some issues there. We've since corrected that and the residents weren't parking there anymore. But that was a more of an issue of residents not wanting to walk a couple more uh, feet so to another parking area and uh, the relationship to the country mart I, s I assume would have a similar uh, positive and, and con conscientious effort to maintain that a absolutely no question about it I mean that's one of the things for us is being a longtime partner in the community so having those open relationships working with folks I actually think there may be an opportunity of parking were being an issue to talk to the mart about overnight parking for our guests at certain points when they're not in service, not operable, is ha, has it, does that, it become a spillover? Has that been broached to date? It has not been formally. We've talked about it informally. They've seemed okay with it. It's just more of how it's implemented, how it's managed. Okay. Uh, further discussion? Uh, is there a motion? I'd like to make the motion. I also like, Seth, what you're doing up there, all the remodel going on in, in the Larkspur courts, and it's, it's really looking nice up there. You're Thank doing you. a nice job. I've been involved in the project since 2007, and I'm very proud of what yeah, we've been able to you do. You should be. So because it's uh, ordinance number 1023 is compliant with the Larkspur Municipal Co Code, along with being passed by the Planning Commission, and I think the enclosed garages are going to look lovely with the storage loft, so I'd like to mo uh, make a motion to pass ordinance number 1023. I have it just to introduce and waive the first reading. Oh, okay. So, right? We have to pass it, though, don't we? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, for the first step for this, you need to introduce okay. um, and waive first reading. So I'll go ahead and introduce and waive ordinance number 1023, an ordinance of the City of Larkspur amending ordinance number 537563 and 617 by modifying the precise development plans for the Larkspur Landing Residence Project, currently referred to as Serenity at Larkspur Apartments. Is that correct? Satisfactory. Great. If there's a motion, is there a second? Second. There's been a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Your, your mic's off. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there's been a motion and a second. There's been a, a vote in favor of the, of the motion, four to zero. The motion carries unanimously. Thanks for all your work. Do you want these? And I appreciate back. the public comment. I think there were some good points made this evening. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Anna. All right, we'll move to the business items on the agenda this evening. The first one is item 8.1, an update on the work of the Joint Powers Agreement Revision Committee for the Central Marin Sanitation Agency. Is there a staff report? 
Uh, very briefly for the council. Uh, as you're aware, the Joint Powers Authority of the Central Marin Sanitation Agency is going through a process to review its uh, charter document, the actual Joint Powers Agreement. Uh, Vice Mayor Hilmer sits on the committee that's reviewing the document. And uh, the way they're operating is to uh, work on sections and then have those sections and issues brought to the respective member agencies for concurrence or discussion. Uh, this one's a little different than the previous reports. The previous reports have really been just language uh, and modifications. In this case, uh, you have two parts to consider. First, on the attachment are some language changes that have been proposed. Uh, but secondly, in the uh, staff report, we've provided some information that we received from the uh, general manager of CMSA, uh, sort of letting folks know uh, some points that have been agreed to, but the language has not yet been drafted. Uh, and those mostly have to do with the member agencies requesting that CMSA uh, not pursue providing service, uh, collection service in the future uh, beyond the areas that it already is providing so, uh, such service. So um, turn over to the council for any feedback you have for Vice Mayor Hilmer. I believe there is a meeting uh, either at the end of this week or next week uh, to discuss these changes. So feedback is timely. And I, I can also take your feedback up until the time of the meeting. Uh, there, there it's ra been rather uneventful from my point of view with a focus on proper definitions, including some definition, definitions such as that for an equivalent dwelling unit, which is not even used currently. <laughs> That's the problem, too. How far along are you in this? Uh, we've had two meetings and two packages of edits, mostly uh, not really changing the way it works. I think that for Larkspur, the significant conversation is toward the end of their process, which is the governance structure of, of CMSA, um, which as the council will recall, the Local Agency Formation Commission has suggested that uh, Larkspur not be seated on the CMSA board anymore. And at some point late the, later in the process, that'll be a discussion. Do you have a, an idea when that might be? Somewhere I, in the I spring? I don't. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions of staff? Why I'm going to ask you. Yes. How do you feel about not being on the, the board? You mean Larks for Larks for I think that should be taken up when that's an okay. agenda. Yeah, I think, I think right, we should no have problem. a focused yeah. discussion right. on that. Okay. You started it, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I was just letting you know that's coming in the future, that yeah. you have gotten that bef information before. That yeah, and we'll, we'll have more information right. at that yeah. time. I look forward to the conversation. All right. Uh, any further uh, direction needed on this item from staff? Not for staff. Any uh, further comment on this from the council? Are there members of the public that would like to ask questions or make comments on this agenda item? Item 8.1. Seeing none, we'll, we'll uh, conclude that item and move to item 8.2, a review of the general plan steering committee work program and schedule. May we have a staff report, please? Vice Mayor Hilmer, I'll be um, very brief. We're presenting a schedule outlining um, uh, future steps and uh, milestones for uh, we're committing to to begin the update process involving the four member steering committee. Uh, what we've outlined here is a series of um, staff tasks and um, general plan steering committee workshop uh, subjects um, and uh, some likely points that we'll have to conduct uh, public workshops as well, uh, sort of doing those in an iterative process to address a variety of topics uh, that remain a little unfinished from the previous uh, work of the general plan advisory committee as well as addressing some elements of uh, state law that in the time thereafter we really need to address or consider um, as we um, finalize the draft general plan. Uh, this is a schedule that really goes out through the year with uh, um, anticipation of beginning 
preparation of an EIR um, late in the year, uh, working that draft in while we complete the draft general plan and within about a year's time have it uh, ready for public hearing before the Planning Commission and City Council. Um, so with that, do you have any questions? Our request is uh, simply to acknowledge the um, timeline we've put out and direct staff to begin uh, preparing uh, any contracts we'll need as we uh, endeavor on this uh, process. Other questions of staff on the staff report? Uh, Council Member Way. Um, I have a um, request is that mm -hmm. uh, we try to get the meeting dates lined up um, on calendar as soon as possible, especially okay. the November and December one, um, because uh, I see that we're going to do a kickoff one in November and calendars are getting tight on my business. So um, I'd like that. Um, that's just a request. And, and also, we never, is it reasonable for us? To to choose a council member alternate if either Kevin or myself cannot be there, or is that appropriate? Because we both have pretty complicated schedules. I just wondered, would it be, if one of us can't make it, do we need an alternate? We don't have a legal reason why you couldn't do it. We might have continuity questions that you want to discuss of whether that, that's an issue in terms of Council members' participation. Okay, so we don't. There's need no legal to have reason. Okay. one way or the other. I just wanted to make sure with that. Um, do we feel like we need one to, to have an alternate? So we do have alternates to all our other. <laughs> I did, uh, it's, it's my concern is um, just that we get things on calendar so that I. Yeah. Well, I I think the challenge at the. Um, matter here is there's going to be a lot of lot of subject matter to absorb and kind of work through right. on a you know every every month every two months um, I'm not sure an alternate role would really be that valuable as opposed to the fact that you'll have two members of both the Planning Commission and the council available to give input um, uh, and possibly you know, report to each other somewhat okay. if, if somebody's unavailable. For that, that's meeting. workable, yeah. And, and these are open to the public. And these will be open to the public, yes. Oh, okay, that's and, great. Are there limits on the number of council members that can participate in that sort of setting? Like some as members of the public and some? There's no, there's a limit on two participating at the meeting because otherwise it would be a meeting of the city council. What, what about co making comments as members of the public? Um, that's technically allowed. I mean, I, I think that uh, that if the c if the council member wanted to attend and participate, I guess I would just say that's um, a generic comment. I just want to make sure that um, depending on how the meetings actually proceed, if they're kind of informal, um, it, it could take on sort of the appearance of there being three council members. As, long, effect, as long as it's made clear, if you're speaking as a member of the public. Yeah, I just just we just need to make sure that the meetings are managed in a way that makes it makes that clear. Uh, are, are there other questions of staff? I, I have one and that might be considered an, an a, amendment or addition to your outline list here. I, I think it would be, I'm hoping we can uh, have opportunities for updates to the various specific plan areas within this framework. Well, that Downtown, wasn't. Downtown, <coughs> the Central Marin area, and also the North Magnolia area. The. Um, and this is where the challenge lies, is the initial direction for the general plan update was, was very much to really take the existing general plan and, and sort of tweak it and update it. And I think at the time uh, that this was initiated, that was a pretty valid approach. But uh, since that time, uh, you know, I've sort of outlined a number of things that have come up in state law and such that need to be addressed. It would be definitely adding uh, a bit more challenge. In fact, part of the direction from the council was do not do not mess, do not modify the class because at the time we we're initiating this, the class was fairly recently uh, well, adopted. I wouldn't now. want it to preclude uh, anything that might come up during discussions about the various uh, city facilities, city assets, city. I, I just think we're going to need some flexibility. Well, and I think uh, and not get down the line and 
be told that there are constraints against what we might want to do because the, we didn't touch the specific plan. Yeah. Uh, part of the process could include looking at that. And we, we as staff did not propose necessarily from this point delving into the specific plan issues, but okay, well, the I'm, 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 as long as you know, I'd, I'd accept being able to deal with some parking issues within mm -hmm. the specific plan areas, but anything we can do to create a little flexibility would be helpful. I guess my only concern is I, th I think that we're pushing it on our budget as it is to, to provide this program. So I'm not, I'm feeling uncomfortable that that's pretty vague what you're asking us to do and, and could lead to pretty extensive costs. So I, I think we need some clarity what you're referring to when you say visit the specific plans. Uh, if, okay. Um, circulation and transportation, if we can handle parking issues within the specific plan areas under that cate category, that, that works? Yeah, well, and, and, and I think one thing that could happen is the the general plan policy may be considered to reduce parking or address parking in some manner. Well, I mean, and then site to look specific. at, if, you know, if we want to target some uh, locations. Okay. I think we'd have to look at, at exactly what's. Well, in, I mean, it's that sort of thing. I want, would like. I think it would be beneficial to have the flexibility to do. So th think about that. I guess, am I hearing your your request is that within the context of the topics identified, you don't want previously adopted documents to serve as constraints to conversation? Yeah. Okay, I think that can be accommodated without any additional work for staff. We would just need to identify, well, this document's a constraint, so at some point we need to reopen this document if the conversation takes us there. And if we have some okay. specific uses we'd like to see considered for certain lo specific locations, I'd like that to be possible. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's within this context is completely doable. I, I initially took your comments to mean you wanted to reopen the specific plans themselves. I think if, if that comes from the conversation, that would be. As long as the, the environmental review can handle that, that's okay. That works. All right, thank you. Council Member Way. So, Neil, to pick, to um, kind of circle back to that question you asked me before the meeting about what documents I have, is that the list under October 2017 that yeah. staff distributes materials? So I'll look for those this weekend to make yeah. sure. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll send out messaging to the uh, committee members, and we'll, as I said, we're in the process of, you know, we'll begin up do adopting, updating the website and have these available both online and, and determine what you really need published. So it's really these six ones right here that are the yeah. main ones. All right. But they're it. all, some of those are pretty thick. So that's, yeah. yeah <laughs> that's why I'm going to go wireless or paperless. Other council member questions or comments? I just think the timeline looks very doable. You did a nice job. All right. I look forward to November, December of 2018, milestones. <laughs> are there members of the public that would like to ask questions or make comments on this agenda item? Yes, sir. If you could step up to the microphone and identify yourself. For the record. My name is uh, Don Edwards and I'm at 15 Tamil Pius Avenue. And I have a question uh, about the planning, uh, basically the steering committee and the work schedule and all things like that. And one of them is, and I've, I refer to Dan, your uh, statement for candidacy. In your statement there, you are saying that you want to repurpose the historic fire station after closing. And I'm concerned that when we were going into the putting, merging the two fire departments together, everybody said, we're not closing a fire station. And I didn't know if this is now part of the plan that we're going to be closing one of the fire stations. No, it's and not. And so I'm confused when I read that on your statement. If it were to ever be considered for closing, I'd like to be able to explore repurposing the building. Okay. I. I, I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of people that are confused about that. They're thinking that the fire station is in fact closing. There's, there's no current decision being, or no discussion about a decision like that thus far. Okay. That answered in, my but, question. But you never know in the future. Absolutely. But it was just such a, such a surprise for yeah. me to see that. I'm sorry. And I do I, appreciate I, I, that. Uh, I was limited to 200 words. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. You've answered my question. Thank you very much. You're all doing a great job. Thank you. 
other members of the public with comments or questions on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council for consideration of direction. The recommendation is that the uh, council review and approve the revised general plan update work plan and direct staff to move forward with preparing budget and consultant contracts to support the general plan steering committee work program. All the above. <laughs> yeah, plan looks good. Looks yeah. great. So I, I think I hear so move. So move. All right, is there a second? We need it. We don't, need don't need it. They they don't need an action. Yeah. No, I don't have any changes. Okay. All right. Direction given. Okay. Direction. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll conclude that item, and we will now adjourn to closed session. Pursuant to government code section 54956.9D4, there's one potential case. and note that there is no reportable action. Uh, Your mic. We're adjourned from closed session and there is no reportable action. Thank you very much. Uh, it's 7.58. Shall we, uh, do you need a motion to adjourn? Uh, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn and, and also uh, please, uh, maybe I can work with the city manager on an uh, appropriate statement in memory of those parties described earlier with respect to the North Bay disaster. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? I'll, I'll uh, move that we adjourn the meeting. And I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. <laughs>